fear is something that is truly instilled. Kids are fearless and they only don't do things when people, whether it's their parent or not, it's like, oh no, stop. That's scary. Like don't touch. It's hot. You know, other than that, they will do anything. And me being someone that is quite terrified of most things, I didn't want them to be scared of things just because I was. So as long as something is safe for them to do, if they're interested in it, we will always let them do it. But I just love seeing them truly live the lives that they want to live as well. And to be able to make those decisions for themselves, because besides just not instilling fear, I also believe that it gives them the confidence to know that they can make decisions for themselves. is The Maverick Show, where you'll meet today's most interesting real estate investors, entrepreneurs, and world travelers, and learn the strategies and tactics they use to succeed. And now, here's your host, Matt Bowles. Hey, everybody. It's Matt Bowles. Welcome to The Maverick Show. My guest today is Monet Hambrick. She is a location independent entrepreneur who travels the world with her husband and two daughters and has created amazing adventures for her family in over 35 countries on six continents. She documents it all in her family travel blog, The Traveling Child, where her goal is to inspire parents to travel the world with their kids while also providing tips to make it easier and affordable. She took her eldest daughter on her first international flight at eight months old and her second daughter on her first international flight at 10 weeks old. Monet's travel motto is, if kids live there, kids can visit. And you'll often find her family exploring destinations that many don't consider, quote, kid-friendly. Monet is also the author of the children's book, The Traveling Child Goes to Rio de Janeiro, the first book in her forthcoming series. In addition to her blog readers, she has also built an Instagram following of over 120,000 people. And Monet is the co-founder of the Black Travel Alliance, whose mission is to support content creators of color and hold travel brands accountable for their lack of diversity within the travel industry. Monet, welcome to the show. Thank you so much for having me. I am so excited that you are here. You are doing really, really awesome stuff. And I'm so excited to introduce you to the Maverick Show audience tonight. So let's just start off by setting the scene, though, and talk about where we are recording this from tonight. We're not in person, unfortunately, but I am in Asheville, North Carolina, on the east coast of the United States in the Blue Ridge Mountains. And where are you tonight? I am in Miami, Florida. That is where our family lives. And we're just here relaxing, enjoying the sun because, you know, we kind of get that in January. <laughs> I love that. It is uh, about the snow here tomorrow. So I am envious of <laughs> your weather. But I actually have some Florida roots. When I was around your daughter's age, actually, I lived in Palm Beach Gardens in South Florida. So I've got a little. Florida lineage there, but I want to go into your sort of backstory, Monet. Can you talk a little bit about where you grew up and as you were growing up, how did your interest and your passion for travel develop? Yeah, so I was born in New York, but I did grow up in South Florida and I am first generation American. So both of my parents are Jamaican born. So I had a passport very early on in life. My parents would often take me back to Jamaica to visit my grandmother and other family there. And even in when we weren't traveling to Jamaica, back when I was younger, I'm sure the same thing for you, like car seats weren't a thing. So my parents have pictures of me with their siblings. I have 17 aunts and uncles. That is not including their spouses. That's just my parents' actual siblings. So they would take road trips from New York to like Boston and other states that were really close. And there's so many pictures of me sitting on someone's lap in the back seat. So I grew up with travel instilled in me from my parents. But what I would say is 
the trip that really changed my life as far as travel wise was when I was in high school, I got a scholarship through this program called Experiment in International Living. And I was able to go to Botswana for five weeks. I think I was like 15 or 16 years old, just with a group of other students and chaperones. I stayed in a village, a village of Odi with a host family for two weeks. We went camping in the Okavanka Delta. We did Habitat for Humanity. And that was for me, like the thing that really, really made me fall in love um, with travel. And after that, I continued to do it. I studied abroad when I was in college and continue to travel. And when I was pregnant, everyone was like, you know, you're not going to be able to travel anymore. And I was like, I don't think you know who I am. <laughs> <laughs> That's amazing. So let's talk a little bit about that and how the story went from there, right? So you are pregnant and you have friends and colleagues saying those types of things to you. And then what was life like after you had your first child with respect to travel? After I had my first child, we got on a plane at six weeks when she was six weeks old. So <laughs> kind of right out the gate, um, we were living in New York at the time. My parents live here in South Florida as well. So um, we came to visit them and that was her first flight. And after that, we took her more and more places. And even when I was pregnant, I was traveling. I actually went to Morocco the day after I found out I was pregnant at five weeks pregnant. So it definitely did not stop me at all because it's really something that I'm passionate about. And I guess it's become a lifestyle for me. It's just something I truly enjoy and don't really feel like myself without doing it. So there was no way that kids were going to stop me. I was just going to bring them along for the journey and figure it out as, you know, as I went on with my husband. So that's awesome. Well, I want to get your tips on a number of different aspects of family travel, but let's start off with the kids at super young age, right? Less than one year old. When you're traveling with kids of that age, can you talk about where you went? Because I know you took both of your daughters on international flights before they turned one. So can you talk about where you went with them? And then how was that travel experience when you were traveling internationally with kids under the age of one? And what tips do you have for parents that are interested in doing that? Yeah. So under the age of one, they went to Jamaica, Colombia, Barbados. When my youngest was eight months old, I even took her to Australia. So quite a few miles before they turned one, the thing that I would recommend the most is if you're nursing or even if you're not on takeoff and landing, definitely nurse or give your child a bottle because that helps so much with the popping of the ears to prevent that. On long haul flights, we would always request the bulkhead seat so we could get a bassinet because like for me, when I went to Australia, my husband actually didn't come with me. So even with two parents on a, such a long flight, holding a baby the entire time is not conducive to anyone being pleasant. So you can get a bassinet where they can sleep in there and you can put them down and be hands free. And my biggest thing always is a carrier. Like I live by carriers. Personally, I always use an ergo baby, but that helped so much because they just nap when they're ready to take a nap and I'm still hands-free and it makes just getting around and maneuvering cities with them very easy, especially if you're traveling to destinations where maybe like if you're going to Europe and there's cobblestone roads and, you know, it's not as conducive to a stroller having the carrier at that age was golden. That's awesome. Well, I also want to ask you about the travel you've done recently. And maybe can you just start by basically introducing your family? I mean, I feel like I already know Jordan and Kennedy and James because I read your blog and I follow your family adventures. But for folks where this is their first time meeting you, can you just talk about the age of your daughters and sort of introduce your family members and what that family dynamic is like when you travel? Yeah. So my husband and I, we met in undergrad at the University of Florida, Go Gators. So we've been together for quite some time now. I think we're about to celebrate our eighth wedding anniversary. So my kids are four and six years old. Well, Kennedy will actually be five in like two weeks, but I'm holding on to her, the age that she is now. Um, and Kennedy is definitely the comedian in the family. 
She is always making people laugh and just full of energy. And Jordan is like, she could go on Jeopardy and win because all she loves to do is watch documentaries and learn random facts as she calls them. And she tells us random facts of the day, every day. And my husband is just go with the flow. Definitely not the planner, but he's also not a complainer, which I appreciate. So he just lets me plan and just goes with the flow. And yeah, that's us. I mean, they're both super adventurous. Part of the things I said, you'll find us going to destinations. Most don't find kid friendly. For my daughter's Kennedy, her second birthday, we went to Costa Rica and she went zip lining and we took surf lessons. So yeah, they're super adventurous, way more than I am. That's amazing. Well, let's talk about that Costa Rica trip. It's a place that you and I have both been and we both appreciate Costa Rica very much. But I would love to hear about how your kids experienced it and how the family trip went to Costa Rica. Yeah. So we went to Costa Rica, as I said, for Kennedy's second birthday. We did La Fortuna and Manuel Antonio. So absolutely loved the La Fortuna area. We hiked the volcano area and we got, you know, got a private tour. They were so good with the kids, the tour guide. He was just so into all the questions my older daughter was asking and just so helpful to us. We went to the hot springs while we were there. That was the first time, again, as a family, we had been zip lining. And that was so much fun just to see my kids' experience that I personally am terrified of heights. But my uh, Jordan, my older daughter, she was four at the time and she was going through the, all the lines by herself. There were just a few that she couldn't go by herself just because of her weight and they were very long. So they just didn't want her to get stuck. But seeing her be so brave, she also did the Tarzan swing in the middle where no adult on the tour was interested in doing it. But here she was doing it. Costa Rica is amazing. Like the food we took a cooking class while we were there. The kids love to do that. So we always try to incorporate that in trips because it's both educational and extremely fun and engaging for them. And then we went to Manuel Antonio where we got to see more animals and like the monkeys and just being by the beach and doing surfing and seeing all the dolphins when we're doing boat tours. So, I mean, Costa Rica is amazing. I would love to go back. That is really awesome. I want to build on that and ask you about something that I heard you say that I thought was really profound. And it relates to sort of what you were talking about with Jordan zip lining and, and wanting to be adventurous was that you prioritize not instilling fear into your kids even if you are scared to do something. So I feel like there's a lot of parents, right, where if they're afraid of something, they're going to be very protective of their kids and make sure their kids don't do anything that they wouldn't do themselves. And I thought when you said this, it really struck me as quite profound as a parenting concept. And I'm wondering if you can talk a little bit more about that and how you implement that. Yeah, so, so many people have said to me, you let your child do that, that's crazy. And for me, it's just about, Fear is something that is truly instilled. Kids are fearless and they only don't do things when people, whether it's their parent or not, it's like, oh no, stop, that's scary. Like, don't touch, it's hot. You know, other than that, they will do anything. And me being someone that is quite terrified of most things, I didn't want them to be scared of things just because I was. So as long as something is safe for them to do, if they're interested in it, we will always let them do it and let them decide for themselves if it's something that they like or that they don't like. Because even with that, they've also gotten me to open up again. When we just went on a recent road trip, I went zip lining with them again, which I thought I wouldn't do. And it's because they're like, no mom, like if we can do it, you can do it. It's so much fun. Let's go. And it makes us all have more fun. But I just love seeing them truly live the lives that they want to live as well. And to be able to make those decisions for themselves, because besides just not instilling fear, I also believe that it gives them the confidence to know that they can make decisions for themselves as well, regardless of the age that they are. And yeah, it goes this hand in hand with like food and everything else. Hey, you try it once if you don't like it, cool, but you'll never know unless you try. So we just really let them lean in and make these decisions on their own 
of course, unless it's like just completely unsafe, then we'll pull the trigger. But other than that, yeah, let them have fun. Let them discover and figure it out for themselves. That's so amazing. And you are taking them to places that are really far away as well. I mean, you're not just taking them to the Caribbean and Central America. You have taken your kids to Asia, to Australia, to Africa on some really long haul flights, 20 plus hour trips to go to some really epic destinations. And I want to ask you about some of them. You and I actually were in Kenya on the exact same month. Unfortunately, we didn't know that, so we weren't able to connect there. But we both went in September because that, of course, is the great wildebeest migration. And if you're going on a safari, boy, is that something special to see. And I would love to hear from your family's perspective how the Kenya trip was and how it was for the kids. Oh, my God. It was amazing. It was everything. One, as a Black family, to be able to take my kids to Africa just was something special in itself. But for us to be able to do the things that we did. So we flew into Nairobi. We went to Amboseli National Park, Masamara. And then we also went to Diani Beach, so on the coast as well. So for them to be able to see the culture, for them to be able to go on the safaris, for us to be able to go to a Maasai tribe and for them to see how they welcome us, for the tribe members to teach them how to make fire and teach them about their traditions. When we were on our safari in the Mara, we actually saw five cheetah take down a topi, which our guide told us is not something that you often see on safaris. So just to be able to have that experience. I remember my kids were two and four when we went. And a lot of people I see in traveling with kids groups are like, such a waste of time and money to take kids to places like this. When they're so young, they won't remember. Like it's You're just wasting your money. One, both of my kids 100% remember. Two, even if they didn't, there are memories that we had as a family and I remember and as a parent and my husband for us to have those special times with our kids is amazing. And then three, they just learn so much. I mean, by the end of our safari, our older daughter was sitting in the front seat with our tour guide. And she was the one that was actually providing us information. She was like, oh, on the left, we see a male ostrich. And I know it's a male ostrich because its neck is pink and the female ostrich's necks are gray, like things like that. And that is just amazing to me. And those are experiences that are just honestly priceless. And oh my God, Kenya was just everything. It was everything. It was, it is a really, really special place. I got to spend about a month there based in Nairobi and also went out to Masai Mara and did the safari. And then I also got to go to some of the neighboring countries, spend some time in Uganda and Tanzania. And it was just, I mean, East Africa was just really super, super special region. But you and I have also separately spent time in North Africa. We've both been to Morocco and I would love to hear about how Morocco was for the family. Yeah. So Morocco was special. We went there. COVID just messes my life up. I want to be like, oh, last year, but it wasn't because last year nobody did anything. (laughs) The year before, 2019, we went for Thanksgiving. And so me and my youngest daughter went for two weeks and my husband and my older daughter actually met us a week into the trip. So the first week I was by myself with my youngest daughter. She was three years old at the time. We flew into Marrakesh and then we flew from there to Fez and then made our way to Chef Chouin, spent time there and then spent more time in Fez. And then we went to Marrakesh and then my husband and older daughter met us there. We all went to the Sahara Desert and then we all explored Marrakesh together. So yeah, even if you are a single parent, you can go anywhere you want with your kids because yeah, if I can go to Morocco with a three-year-old by myself, you can do it too. That's so amazing. You know, I've spent probably about a month in Morocco. I've been a couple of times and I've been to Marrakesh and I've been to Fez and I've been to Tangier and I've been to Casablanca. I have yet to get to Chef Shawin and it is so high on my list for people that have never heard of this city. Can you share a little bit about what Chef Shawin looks like and what the experience was like, especially with the kids there? 
Yes. Oh my God. So it is beautiful. It's known as the blue city because literally all the walls painted in the city are blue and it is just gorgeous. So a lot of people don't make it there because there is no airport. So when my daughter and I went, we flew into Fez and then we were actually supposed to take the bus from Fez to Shepshuan, but our flight was delayed. So we missed the last bus. So we actually took a taxi. It's four hours. It's a like three to four hour drive from Fez. So we took a taxi there. And then on the way back to Fez, we got the bus because it's way cheaper than the taxi. But it's just this beautiful, beautiful city that just has so much pride in the people that live there. It's very small. A lot of people actually only do day trips. Like they'll do a day trip from Fez. We spent two or three nights. I highly recommend staying over because there is lots to do. We took a painting class with our Airbnb host. There's beautiful hiking there as well. It definitely deserves more than a day trip in my opinion, but you have to hire a photographer when you're there because if you don't, you will regret it because there are just so many beautiful places. And it is a little confusing, just like Marrakesh in general, uh, Morocco in general, like if you're in like Marrakesh and things to get around. So having the photographer also helped <laughs> with navigating the city. Uh, it's just so beautiful. And the food is just so good. So, so good. That's amazing. Well, the other place that I want to talk to you about is Brazil. And I want to mention the book that you authored, which I actually am holding right here. I have it on my desk, which is called The Traveling Child Goes to Rio de Janeiro. It's a super, super awesome children's book. I am actually going to gift this book to my sister who has three kids under the age of eight, and they are going to love it. I think the book is really fantastic because... It really shows from a child's perspective. I mean, first of all, it provides sort of the geography of Brazil, where it is, how big it is. And then it shows sort of from a kid's perspective, the excitement of traveling there on travel days and getting to watch kids' movies on the plane and all the things that they're learning about language while they're there and what they're seeing and what they're experiencing. And it just kind of goes through the entire experience from the perspective of kids. And so I think I think my sister's kids are really, really going to love this book. I think you did an awesome, awesome job on it. And I want to just sort of use that to maybe open this up for you to talk about the Brazil experience in general, which obviously the book is based upon and how that was for your family. And then what inspired you to go the route of creating a children's book series? Yeah. So thank you so much. And what you touched on was like exactly what I wanted the book to feel like being like educational, but fun and preparing kids who may not fly all the time for what the flight was like. So I really appreciate that. Brazil was amazing. Oh my gosh. The culture, the food, the music, just everything about it was amazing. As I mentioned before, we are really big on doing cultural things and finding unique ways to get our kids excited about the itinerary. So two things that they absolutely love to do is cooking and dancing. So on every trip that we go on, if possible, we book a cooking class and we book a dance class so we can learn the traditional dance, which in Brazil is samba. So we learned that. And when we did our cooking class, we learned how to make their traditional dish, maqueca fish. So being able to do that coupled with going to Christ the Redeemer, of course, you can't go to Rio and not go there. And doing historical tours, we were able to do a tour through a local, through Airbnb experiences on the Black history in Brazil. And for those that are unaware, Brazil actually had the most enslaved people be come from Africa to their country. So it was just amazing. I mean, there's just so many layers. And then we did, I don't know if you did this when you went, but we did the uh, Pedro do Telegrafo hike with like the infamous cliff hanging optical illusion photo. It's really fun to post that picture and see people's reactions because some people don't know exactly what it is. It basically looks like you're hanging off of a cliff, like you're willing to die for Instagram. But all you do is put your feet down and you're touching the ground. You just hold the camera at a certain angle and it makes it a quite interesting photo. So, oh, Brazil was everything. 
Yeah, Brazil is so special. It's so amazing. And then can you talk about the children's book series, The Traveling Child Goes To? This was the first book in the series. And what is to come, how you're going to build out the series, and really what your goal is with the children's book series? Yeah, so my goal is really just to provide one diversity within the travel space. That's something that I am huge on. If you type in family travel in Google images, you're not going to see families that look like mine. Oftentimes when you look at pamphlets, brochures, commercials from a lot of destinations, you don't see families that look like mine either. And I'm one to, instead of like, I can complain about it all day and it is something that needs to be fixed, but instead of relying on other people to fix it, I'm like, well, what can I do? So I decided to take our beautiful images and stories and experiences off the internet and into the hands of children. So brown and black children can see themselves in a book about travel with other brown and black children that are exploring all over the world. So they know that the possibilities are endless, that they can go anywhere that they choose, but also for non-black and brown families to diversify the books that they have in their houses as well, because they it's as important for non-black and brown families to have books with black and brown characters as well. And I just wanted it to be something that was educational, but fun, like a really lighthearted story, but also providing the child information on the country, on the country's culture. And then it also has, you know, like the links to my website. So you can see the itinerary that we took for the trip. So if you decide to go there, you already have an itinerary that you can just pull pieces from. So the next book will be The Traveling Child Goes to Kenya. And then after that will probably be Jamaica. But yeah, I just plan to write as many as people will buy. So as long as one person buys each one, I'll keep writing them. (laughs) That's so amazing. Well, I wanted to also mention, of course, that you are one of the co-founders of the Black Travel Alliance, which is amazing. I've interviewed a number of your other co-founders on this podcast already. But for folks where this is their very first time hearing about the Black Travel Alliance, can you talk about that and what you're up to with that? Yeah, so the Black Travel Alliance, we founded it last year at the height of the Black travel movement. I mean, it's something that I think all of us individually, it's been something that's been on our mind, as I just mentioned, even the reason why I wrote my book, which was long before I co-founded the Black Travel Alliance. Instead of, again, like complaining about things, what are things that we can do to uplift Black content creators in the travel space? So one, it is holding travel brands accountable for their lack of diversity or for maybe things that they say that are not the correct way to say things, but really to uplift Black travel content creators, providing them with a space that they can find opportunities within the travel industry, whether those are writing gigs or press trips, providing education educational webinars for them to attend. So I'm actually on the training and events committee and we hold monthly or bi-monthly webinars providing tips for Black travel content creators on how to build their brand, how to work with brands, how to use email marketing to your advantage. And then our goal is to also provide scholarships. A lot of times the gap, as you see in like travel conferences like TravelCon or TBEX, is that really like 99% of the attendees are white and cost does sometimes have to do with that. So providing scholarships to attend these travel conferences so they can also have the same opportunities as other people in the industry. So yeah, we just had in December a wavelength program, which was for brands to network specifically with Black content creators and You can have individual meetings with the brands to see how you could work together in the future. So really just providing avenues so there can be no more excuse of, oh, I didn't know where to find Black travel content creators. They don't exist. There's none that are doing solo travel. There's none that are doing family travel. There's none that have been here. There's none that are doing luxury travel. No, enough with the excuses here. It is. We have it all for you in one place. That's so awesome. 
And I also want to ask for your travel tips for Black folks that may be at the earlier part of their travel journey and for Black families in particular. Yeah. So I would say, honestly, just go. Yes, there are racist people in other countries, but I mean, there are racist people in the United States. So don't let that prohibit you from exploring the world. There are some places that you might have to be a little bit more careful or understanding that in certain places like Asia, for instance, I studied abroad in China. I've been to quite a few Asian countries. They don't necessarily see Black people that often and a lot of times follow you around to take pictures of you without asking, jump into your photo and put their arms around you without asking. So just being aware of things like that, that could happen to you that aren't going to happen to other travelers. But my thing is just, yeah, like I'm not going to let the color of my skin prevent me from exploring the world. So I'm still going to go everywhere. And I hope that's for all travelers. That's awesome. Let's talk a little bit about your blog now, The Traveling Child. And I would love to start all the way back when you began the blog until now. And I also want to, you know, incorporate in here as well, your entrepreneurial journey. I know you started the blog when you were working a full-time job in corporate America, and you're now, of course, a location independent entrepreneur that is making a lot more money than you were in corporate America. And you've been able to monetize this and build it and grow it. But maybe just take us on that journey about how it started and then, you know, what you you built it into today and what folks can expect when they check out The Traveling Child? Yeah, so it almost didn't start. I was 100% against having a blog or Instagram. It was actually my friend Paula Irving, shout out to her. She came to visit me a few weeks before we were going on that trip to Columbia right after I had Kennedy. And she's like, oh, you should really start an Instagram about your travels. And I was like, no, thank you. And she was like, no, but like there's so many parents or want to be parents that think that life and travel stop after having kids. But here you are. I've seen you take Jordan to Jamaica. You went to Italy when Jordan was one and you were 16 weeks pregnant with Kennedy. You've been on cruises while pregnant, like all these things. She's like, you have so many experiences. And I think it's really powerful to parents and those that or those that travel and think that travel will stop once they start a family to show them that it doesn't. So I sat on it for a few weeks and then decided that maybe she was right. I was just afraid that people would think, oh, you're just trying to show off, you know, because that's never my intention. Like, oh, just showing off. Here you go with your kids to this country and that country. So I've always been super focused on providing an educational aspect with it, providing to my community ways that we make travel with kids easier from tips for surviving long haul flights to making it affordable as a family of four, how we're able to afford travel. Because as you said, like I was working a regular corporate America job and that's what my husband does as well. And not rich by any means, but still being able to travel five to 10 times a year. So sharing all those resources with my community and then providing the itineraries for all the trips that we go on. I am a planner, but I know that everyone isn't. So after all our trips, I load up our itineraries on our website to make it easier for other people. And even if you're not parents, because again, we do things that you can 100% do without kids and still have just as much fun. So if you want help planning a trip, it's on my website for free. You can have the itinerary, take whatever parts of it you want. But yeah, so I started in 2016. And then in October 2018, I left my full-time job and moved down to a part-time job. And then in April or May of 2019, I quit that completely and have been on this whirlwind ride of entrepreneurship full-time, which has been both scary and exciting and at the same time, oftentimes. (laughs) (laughs) That's amazing. Can you talk about some business tactics here for a bit, particularly for content creators, people that aspire to build a blog, build an audience, build an Instagram following, and then be able to monetize that in a meaningful way and eventually get it to the point where they can exceed the income that they were making at their job? Can you talk about some of the 
tactics, techniques, maybe some of the biggest leverage points and any tips that you have for folks that want to do that? Yeah. Well, first, having a strong community is key, especially when you're talking about monetization, because whether you're monetizing through brand partnerships or you're monetizing through selling your own products, you have to have a strong community because if you don't, brands aren't going to want to give you money to post sponsored content. And if you're having your own product, your community is not going to trust you enough to shell out their money to provide that to you. So building a strong community, I've been in Clubhouse recently that I know a lot of people have. And I was in a room one time and I was moderating and someone was like, yeah, but like, I don't have that many followers. You know, I'm just trying to get 10K to 20K. And my biggest advice would be focus on who is in your community now, because if you can't build a strong relationship with people when you have 50 or a hundred or a thousand members in your community, how are you going to build a connection with your audience when you have 50,000 or a hundred thousand? So for me, it's always been about truly being a safe space where I can talk about horrible instances that have happened when we traveled, as well as the amazing things that has happened, always responding to comments, responding to DMs, and providing valuable content. So whether you choose to be provide entertaining content or educational content, you have to provide value to those that are consuming it. And I found that has helped me to grow the most because that's when people will share my content, whether they're sharing it through stories, they're telling their friends or bigger accounts are sharing my content to their communities, millions of people that in turn grow my community. That's awesome. Well, your blog is absolutely fantastic. It's super substantive. It's really, really, really well done. It has a lot of amazing content on it for sure. We're going to link that up in the show notes so everybody can go and check it out. And you mentioned when you were talking about it, one of the things that you provide there, of course, which I have checked out, is your tips on how to do this affordably. Mm -hmm. And I'm wondering if you can at least share a couple of those now, because I feel like that is the paralyzing part for a lot of folks that don't travel internationally. They might aspire to, but they don't feel that they're in a financial position to do that. And they just are overwhelmed by that objection, right? So you have found some incredible ways to do this a lot less expensively than many people think is possible. So can you talk about some of the techniques that you use to do this in an affordable way? Yes, of course. So for us, the main thing is following the deal. Too often times, you know, people, if you have a specific destination and specific dates that you're going someplace, most times going to be expensive to go there. However, if you can be flexible and follow the deal, that's when you'll find affordable travel. That's how we went to Brazil during my daughter's spring break. So during school holidays for $300 round trip from Miami on a nonstop flight. I've been to Denver from here for $30 round trip. And a lot of times people think, yeah, they avoid international travel because they think it's so expensive. But oftentimes we travel more internationally than domestic because it's actually cheaper for us to go overseas based on the flight deals that we get and based on the exchange rate of money and the cost of living in other countries. When we went to Thailand with a flight deal coupled with points and miles. We didn't pay for our flights at all. And in Thailand, you can get meals for $1.25, $1.50 and be eating really good. So your money can stretch super far there. So I think oftentimes it's just the mindset of people not understanding that it's not as expensive and then to like always trying to pick a place and pick a date. But if you're flexible, you can use websites like Secret Flying and the flight deal to be able to find really, really, really affordable flights. At this point in your family's travel journey, I want to just ask what you feel the impact has been on your kids of doing all of this travel. And from their perspective, you know, how would they describe what travel has meant in their life and what they've gotten out of it? Yeah. So for them, it has taught them so much. I mean, just from like basic everyday things like 
learning how to be adaptable, having to adapt to change or being patient. You know, if we have a flight delay, understanding that things are out of your control, sometimes there's nothing that we can do but sit here longer, you know, adapting to being in a country with people that don't look like them, that don't speak the same language as them, but being okay with that and not thinking it's something that's negative, but embracing other cultures, which I think the world needs way more of these days. And just learning about things that they may not learn about in school. Unfortunately, some things that the education system leaves out. We just recently, well, I guess it's been a few months now, we went on a four and a half week road trip through Tennessee, Georgia, and Louisiana, and going to places like Memphis and being able to go to the Slave Haven Underground Museum and the National Civil Rights Museum, and for them to learn about things in Black history that is not always taught in school, for them to visit a plantation in New Orleans, for them to visit Dr. Martin Luther King Jr.'s birth home in Atlanta. There's things that you can read in a book But it's completely different when you actually experience it, when you can see it, when you can touch it. So I guess another motto of ours is the world is your classroom. And we truly believe that when we travel to places, we're enriching our kids' lives. They're learning about things. And when you do something, you often remember it way more than if you just read it. So when we're learning how to samba dance, that's very different than just watching someone else do it or reading about it. When we're learning how to make traditional Costa Rican food, it's very different. So I think they've learned so much and it just builds character and hopefully will make them into some pretty amazing humans. That's so amazing. One of the other things you wrote about on your blog, which I thought was super profound, was you talked about the benefits to you of traveling with children and why the experience is different and uniquely beneficial. Can you talk about that? Yeah. So for me, I feel like when I travel with my kids, I personally learn more. I take it slower. Like Kids do tend to slow you down. And sometimes as adults, we're always on like, go, go, go. But I love that. They make me slow down. They make me appreciate things. They notice things that adults don't always notice. And when they notice it, they point it out. And I just feel like it brings another level of the experience to our travels. And they also have so many questions. Oh my God. (laughs) But with those questions, they expect answers, which means that I always end up learning way more than I thought I would. Especially I told you my six-year-old Jordan, the girl loves like documentaries, loves history and stuff. So she asks so many questions, things that I wouldn't even think of. And it just enriches the experience because we're learning so much more because either she's asking it and the tour guide is answering or she's asking me and I don't know it and I have to find the answer for her or or else she will never stop asking me. So for me, it just also has allowed us to learn so much more. And as I said, even for me, like not even educational wise, I am terrified of lots of things. I was never an adventurous person. I was the friend at uh, theme parks that held all their friends' bags at the bottom and waited for them to go on roller coasters. So they have taken me out of my comfort zone and pushed me to participate in adventurous experiences that I otherwise wouldn't have. So there are so many reasons I'm thankful for my experiences with them as well. That's so awesome. I love that. Can you talk a little bit as well about trip planning, which I know is one of your fortes, and I'm sure that the trip planning process evolves and changes a bit as the kids get older and there are different ages in terms of what you're looking to do there. So can you just give an example, for example, right now at the age that Jordan and Kennedy are today, as you start to plan your next post-COVID-19 international trips, what does that trip planning process look like for you? Yeah. So it's always, again, like our destination is going to be based on some flight deal. And then it's finding activities that, well, first we always decide like individually, what is our must do in that destination? 
So making sure that everyone in the family, all four of us are completely satisfied leaving the destination, knowing we got to do the one thing we always, we all wanted to do. And then it is curating an itinerary that is not too overbearing, but also that we do get to do a lot. We're not the type to like just sit around in like our hotel or Airbnb. We do like to get out a lot, but trying to also incorporate just fun things for the kids. When we went to Copenhagen, the Airbnb that we stayed in, it was a family and we knew that they'd had toys because they they had it in their listing. And they also said that there was a playground down the street. So we knew that in between things to keep them happy because they still are kids, allowing them to do things like that. And then looking up things to do based on our interests. So finding things that are educational, but also have to do with things that we like to do and trying to keep it to like two activities a day, max. That way we're not wearing them out, you know, too much. But as I said before, it's like, it's really no holds bar. We'll look at other people's blogs to find ideas for things to do. We'll look at, you know, websites like Viator or Get Your Guide, Airbnb Experiences, and look at those things and then try to map out what makes the most sense for us. That's so, so awesome. We are going to link all of these resources up in the show notes, as well as your blog, of course. And Monet, at this point, are you ready to move in to the lightning round? I guess I am. Let's do it. The lightning round. All right. What is one book that has significantly influenced you over the years you'd most recommend people check out? Ooh, Rich Dad, Poor Dad, even though I'm not a dad. (laughs) (laughs) A classic in personal finance, good pick. All right, if you could have dinner with any one person that's currently alive today that you've never met, just you and that person alone for dinner and an evening of conversation, who would you choose? Rihanna. Good pick. All right. If you could go back in time, knowing everything that you know now and give one piece of advice to your 18-year-old self, what would you say to 18-year-old Monet? Do not go to grad school. (laughs) Interesting. Well, honestly, it really depends on your field and the work that you plan on doing. But for me, I just wish that I went to grad school right after undergrad Because I was like, oh, if I don't do this now, I'll never do it. But I also think maybe if I had held off, maybe I would have realized it wasn't needed or necessary. I just feel like sometimes education is just pushed so much. And we feel like, oh, in order to go to the next step, we have to have a higher degree and all these things. And for some circumstances, you 100% have to. But I also think, you know, there's a debt issue in America and For me personally, especially where my life is now, and even when I was working in corporate America, it just never did anything for me. So I could have used that money as a down payment on my house instead. Fair enough. Good advice. All right. What is your top parenting tip for how to raise amazing children? Ooh, let them try things, let them fail, and really just let them be themselves, like encourage them to do the things that they love and interest them. Because when you do that, it just builds confidence. That's awesome advice. All right, Monet, of all of the places that you have been now, what are your top three favorite travel destinations you would most recommend people check out? Kenya. I'm Jamaican, so I'm biased. Jamaica. (laughs) And, ooh, I'm going to go with Japan, I think. Nice. Those are awesome picks. Now, since you are Jamaican, I want to allow you to promote the homeland here and let folks know what they should do when they visit Jamaica. Why is it amazing? And and what should folks do when they plan a trip there? They should get off the resorts. Leave the resorts. Leave it. (laughs) So many people stick to like, oh, Jerez, Negril you know, Montego Bay and stick to the resort. There is more than Dunn's River Falls. I mean, Dunn's River Falls is amazing, but there is Blue Hole. There is St. Elizabeth, which is the parish that my family is from. There's Pelican Bar, which is the most amazing experience there. 
um, and YS Falls, beautiful. And then there is also Portland, which to me is the most underrated parish in Jamaica. You can go to Reach Falls, Winifred Beach, Frenchman's Cove. You have to go to the Jerk, the Boston Jerk Hut while you're there. It's a place where they have multiple jerk spots and go rafting down the Rio Grande. Yeah, leave the resort and really explore. And then if you want some really good food, if you are in certain areas, you can go to this place called Scotchies. But yeah, get off the resort. There's so much to see. Awesome tips. All right, Monet, final question. What are your top three bucket list destinations? These are places you've never been. They're the highest on your list you would most love to see. Egypt, Antarctica, and it's not one place, but I really like to go to all the national parks in the U.S. I cheated on number three. <laughs> <laughs> That's all right. We'll just wrap it together as a number three U.S. national parks and uh, we'll we'll give it to you. Well, I've spent about a year in Egypt living in Cairo. So whenever you're ready to plan that trip, feel free to hit me up for some tips on that. But those are really, really great picks. Monet, this was so awesome to have you here. I want you to let folks know how they can find you, check out your blog, follow you on Instagram, and any other way you want people to come into your universe. Yes. So you can follow me on Instagram at The Traveling Child. It's also the same for Facebook. Our website is thetravelingchild.co. And yeah, that's about it. Amazing. So great to have you here, Monet. We are going to link up all of that in the show notes. So folks can just go to one place at themaverickshow.com and just go to the show notes for this episode. And there you will find all of the links and handles for how to connect with Monet, as well as everything else that we've talked about on this episode. Monet, thank you so much for being on the show. Awesome. Thank you so, so, so much for having me. All right. Good night, everybody. Be sure to visit the show notes page at themaverickshow.com for direct links to all the books, people, and resources mentioned in this episode. You'll find all that and much more at themaverickshow.com. Learn how Maverick Investor Group can help you buy cash-flowing rental properties in the best U.S. real estate markets, regardless of where you live. Schedule a free phone consult today at themaverickshow.com slash consult. Now you can buy rental properties with tenants and local property management in place so you don't have to be a landlord or a rehabber to get your questions answered and discuss how Maverick Investor Group can help you meet your real estate investing goals. Schedule your free phone consult today at themaverickshow.com forward slash consult. If you like podcasts, you will love audiobooks, and you can get your first one for free at themaverickshow.com slash audiobook. Whether you want the latest best-selling novels or books on investing, business, or